Kent Myers. I'm Mick Cornett, and it's time for the verdict. As a part of its traditional and continuing commitment to public and community service, Crow and Dunleavy Law Firm presents The Verdict, an objective discussion of contemporary legal issues hosted by Kent Myers. And also brought to you by a friend of Oklahoma Lawyers for Children and Delta Dental Plan of Oklahoma. And welcome to The Verdict. I'm Mick Cornett. Well, as our regular viewers are aware, this is a show where we discuss legal topics with what we think is a down-to-earth approach. And let me introduce my co-host and one of Oklahoma's top legal experts, Kent Myers. And Kent, today we're going to discuss HMOs. Health Maintenance Organizations, uh, a subject that either brings a smile or a frown <laughs> to most people's faces. Uh, it's a relatively new concept mm -hmm. that takes the place, or uh, is a partial substitute at least, for the regular health insurance company that many of us were, were familiar with in the past. Uh, HMOs uh, are either getting a bad rap or they're uh, doing things uh, in ways that anger people because there's a lot of animosity out in the public about how HMOs do business. Not, we'll see today from our guests whether this is uh, principally uh, a product of just people not being used to it or, or whether there are some real problems out there. Uh, I hope this show uh, will help our viewers understand that there are problems with HMOs that can be dealt with in the courts. We're going to talk uh, a lot about suing your HMO and can you do it. And I want to bring up a cartoon now uh, to take a look. And there is the uh, doctor telling the patient, if the treatment doesn't work, perhaps a successful suit against the HMO will make you feel good again. And he's got kind of a grin on his face. Uh, it, it is almost a conspiracy, if you will, between the medical profession not liking how HMOs do business and the patients not liking how HMOs do business. But uh, we'll see. HMOs have been called a necessary evil. Uh, that the longer they're around, they're becoming more, more and more necessary and less and less evil. Well, and a lot of them are, are insolvent. A lot of them are, are going bankrupt here in Oklahoma. There are a lot of problems. And uh, d should the government involve? Should the government not get involved? I mean, there's a lot of issues here. There are a lot, and we've got two really good guests that know a lot about it. Well, I'm anxious to get started. We will welcome Brad Henry and Kevin Gordon to the program when we return, and I would expect another lively discussion right here on The Verdict. What's MAPS for Kids? It's part of a comprehensive reform plan to get Oklahoma City area schools back on the right track. It means new and renovated schools, discipline and accountability, advanced technology to prepare our children for the 21st century workplace. To find out what MAPS for Kids means for you, go to www.mapsforkids.org. MAPS for Kids, building Oklahoma City's future by investing in our kids. In Oklahoma, there are more than 1,600 children waiting to be adopted. They're of all ages. And for many, home has been a source of pain and conflict. They've dreamed of finding a better life and a loving family. Consider adoption. For more information, call 1-877-OK-SWIFT or visit the website www.okdhs.org. Adopt. It may be the toughest job you'll ever love. children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all of the quality assistance and representation that can be offered in our legal system. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children has over 350 of the best attorneys and volunteers in Oklahoma County who donate their time and services to represent children. For more information, call 405-23-CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children. 
helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. And Kent, why don't you introduce our special guest? We're glad to have uh, back as a return guest the Honorable Brad Henry. Uh, senator Henry is the Democratic Senator from District 17 in Shawnee. He's a man who studied economics in undergraduate school and in doing so was uh, named the outstanding senior man in his graduating undergraduate class. He was an OU law graduate and has drafted a number of important uh, uh, measures on health care and that's what we're going to be talking about today, health care and HMO. So Senator Henry, really glad to have you back. Thank you, Ken. It's good to be back again. Uh, on my left is my colleague, Kevin Gordon, a good friend and um, uh, a lawyer that uh, has been practicing 16 years. Uh, Kevin is an undergraduate uh, of Westminster College and a law graduate with honors uh, from uh, Washington University Law School in St. Louis. Uh, Kevin also teaches health care law and has written articles about the health care subject. And uh, perhaps as importantly as anything, has actually represented in the courtroom HMOs sued by uh, uh, people who were unhappy with their treatment. So, Kevin, thanks for coming. Thank you. Uh, as our viewers know, we tried to end up uh, at the end of the show with the viewers knowing a little bit more about the subject, we hope, than uh, at the beginning. And I want to start out with a little brief uh, a discussion of the HMO diamond, if you will. So, uh, Is Mick, that my cue to get That's out? your cue. Could you <laughs> <laughs> pull the chart up for All us? Right. Uh, uh, Kevin, would you take us through the four principal players in the uh, HMO uh, setting? I'd be glad to, Kent. This is a, uh, a very simplified version of the way health care is delivered in the United States through a health maintenance organization. Uh, but I'd like to try to summarize it with the use of this diamond. And if the viewers could start with the right side of their screen, the section uh, labeled as employer. That's where in Oklahoma virtually all members of HMOs receive their benefits. There are some states, California notably, where you can actually go out and buy HMO coverage if you're an individual, but almost everybody that's covered by an HMO is covered because they're covered as an employee benefit. Well, let me ask you, does an employer have a legal obligation, assuming there's no contract, does, a lawyer, uh, does an employer have a legal obligation to give an employee health, health benefits? An, uh, an employer does not have a legal obligation, which is really the crux of the issue when we talk about the costs of health care services and the escalation of the costs, because as prices and costs go up, employers find it more and more difficult to provide the level of benefits they'd like to to their employees. Uh, either they have to increase the amount that the employee contributes to their health care premiums, or they have to limit the benefits in some way. All right, who's, who's next to talk about that? Uh, well, the employer uh, has a contract with the HMO. This is a little different than the traditional insurance sense, uh, the traditional insurance arrangement. Now, while insurance companies do have contracts with, their, uh, with the employers, the HMO contract is more driven, if you will, by what the employer wants to provide in the way of benefits because the employers, uh, particularly the larger employees have a, employers, have a lot of leverage. So while a patient has direct dealing with the HMO, the patient doesn't, doesn't have a direct contractual relationship with the HMO, the employer does. That's right, Kent. The, right. Co the contract is between the employer and the HMO. Uh, also on the chart, there's a reference to you, the patient, uh, and the patient, uh, while they don't have a direct contract with the HMO, do, uh, they are covered members of the HMO, so that they're entitled to receive the benefits of the contract between the employer and the HMO. Okay, the fourth, the fourth person in the diamond then, or entity in the diamond? The fourth uh, person or the fourth group are the medical providers, whether they're doctors or hospitals, uh, nursing care facilities, the, the providers. And this is different from traditional insurance, what we call indemnity insurance, where the patient goes to a doctor, receives care, and has the financial obligation to pay for the cost of that care. Uh, they submit a claim to their insurance company, and then the insurance company pays the patient, or they might pay the provider directly if that's the agreement. But in an HMO situation, 
uh, in contrast, there is a direct contract between the HMO and the health care provider so that the HMO pays a certain amount per month typically to the provider for all of the care or substantially all of the care that the patient needs. Is the HMO looking at it as if their, their client is the patient or their client is the employer? In other words, where's their allegiance? Uh, their allegiance is to the employer under the terms of their contract, but their members and the patients which they really focus on are the individual employees. If the employees aren't satisfied, then they complain to their employers and the employers may look elsewhere. Uh, let me uh, ask Senator Henry uh, a question. Uh, HMOs are relatively new in the sense that they're 20 or 25 years old. Why did they get started in the first place and what was wrong with the indemnity insurance system we had prior to HMOs? <laughs> Well, those are easy questions to answer, Kent. <laughs> You're exactly right. HMOs are relatively new in Oklahoma. Uh, we first authorized HMOs in 1976. That is, the legislature did. And the first HMOs actually signed up in Oklahoma in about 1983, I believe. Today, we have uh, 10 HMOs in the state of Oklahoma. Originally, the, uh, the, the concept of managed care and health maintenance organizations was uh, was it came to the forefront in an effort to provide lower cost medical care in a in a managed setting and that's why HMOs developed because of the fact that that we had literally skyrocketing health care costs nationwide well there are two areas of managed uh, care that I think make a lot of people uncomfortable uh, at the least and angry at the, at the, at the most and the first is the uh, limitation on the number of providers, uh, in other words, doctors or hospitals, that may be available to a particular patient. In the past, if I wanted to go to my family doctor, my uh, regular insurance, health insurance uh, <coughs> provider would pay the cost, some or all of that. Uh, but now under the HMO uh, setup, that isn't uh, possible unless that particular provider has an arrangement with the HMO. Kevin, why is that that way and why is that necessary? Well, initially, Kent, it evolved because the HMOs had to have contracts with the healthcare providers so that uh, they could uh, have the arrangement whereby they would pay the providers a certain dollar amount per month per member to provide the care to their members. Uh, as HMOs have become a bigger part of the market, the number of providers that sign up with the HMOs has increased. So now it's very common for someone that signs up with an HMO to be able to find his or her own pre-existing doctor on the panel of so the that's, HMOs. So that's changing for the better. That's right. The panels are bigger. Doctors work with many different HMOs, not a single HMO usually, so that this limitation on the providers has not, be, not been as big an issue recently. Let me interrupt at this point and get us to a break. We'll be right back and continue our discussion. You're watching The Verdict with Mick Cornett, Kent Myers. Our guests are Brad Henry and Kevin Gordon. We're discussing HMOs. What's your verdict? stuff. Campfires for boys too, not just girls. But hey, campfires definitely for kids. So call the campfire office nearest you to join in on the fun. Because let's face it, you're not getting any younger. St. Gregory's University has been changing the lives of people like me for 125 years. Affordable, private Catholic education balanced with dedication to community and service makes St. Gregory special. We're extremely proud of our students' outstanding academic achievements and our nationally ranked athletic teams. It's when you help a student build a future of balance, integrity, and service that you change a life forever. St. Gregory's, a community for life. On Broadway is Oklahoma's premier youth musical theater company. Bringing our daughter here was one of the smartest things we've ever done. I've learned a lot. I've gained a lot of confidence. They helped me develop talents I never knew I had. And it's fun. 
on Broadway, Oklahoma's premier youth musical theater company. Now enrolling in Edmond, call 330-CAST. That's 330-2278. Every day, in state governments throughout the country, crucial decisions are being made that affect the lives of children and their families. But as this process takes place, children are often left voiceless. When these children raise their hands to be heard, is anyone listening? There are people listening. They are child advocates. Join us and raise your hand for kids. And welcome back on The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers, and this week we have Brad Henry and Kevin Gordon as our guests. Kent, where are we here as we discuss HMOs? I think one thing that I would really want to ask you about and get some opinion about is suing your HMO. Um, I have a general understanding from looking at our diamond, we don't need to call it back up again, but looking at the diamond, I don't have any doubt that the patient can sue their doctor if the doctor does something wrong. The patient can sue their employer if the employer does something wrong, but I have a general understanding that there may be a problem with the uh, patient mm -hmm. suing the HMO. Uh, Senator Henry, what, what's your understanding of that, generally speaking? Well, that's, that's absolutely correct. And there's a, there's a distinction. Patients can sue HMOs for contractual benefits, so that if an, HM, if an HMO denies, uh, let's say, a bone marrow transplant, and you go through the review process, uh, and you sue them and you prevail, then the HMO is liable to pay for, or at least the value of that bone marrow pro uh, transplant. The problem is, during the interim, as, you, as you're going through the process to try to force the HMO to pay, you may actually die because you didn't receive that bone marrow transplant, or you may be injured in other ways, and you can't sue your HMO for those other injuries, what we call personal injuries, like you can anyone else, any other industry uh, in this nation is held accountable in the court system. How do they get that protection? Well, it evolves, and, and Kevin is more of the expert in this area, but it evolves from the federal uh, preemption laws through ERISA, uh, as well as the contractual rights within the HMO plan itself. But Federal laws have traditionally uh, preempted state regulation in this area and held that you can only sue the HMO for those contractual benefits. And the problem is there's no incentive there for the HMO to pay those benefits quickly or up front because in the end, even if they get sued and lose, all they have to pay are the same benefits that they would have had to pay up front. I see. Well, Kevin, why is that fair? Well, it's, it's, it really comes down to a question of cost. And by way of a very brief history on this, HMOs were, came into, the, uh, into popular culture, if you will, as a result of an act in 1973, the Federal HMO Act. And the act Senator Henry alludes to, ERISA, was passed the next year, in 1974. And the idea was that Congress wanted to encourage employers who don't have to offer health care benefits to offer health care benefits to their employees. And to do that, it had to be affordable and there had to be some protections. Uh, so there is just a cost-benefit analysis that Congress did as a matter of public policy and decided that in order to encourage employers to offer health care benefits, whether they're insurance benefits or HMO benefits, there ought to be a single uniform standard applicable to the way contracts are interpreted and the kinds of lawsuits that members can bring. So it's not just HMOs that can only be sued for the cost of the care. A health insurance company can only be sued for that as well, and it's based on this public policy reason of encouraging employers to offer benefits and to keep the benefits affordable. Well, the fear is, I guess, that if there is no limitation on what can be recovered in a, in a suit like this, uh, that the suits will mount up and uh, eventually run the HMOs out of business. Well, they'll run the HMOs out of business, but more importantly, probably, they'll increase the cost of health care to the point that employers choose not to offer it. And that's what's begun to happen with just a few very large verdicts against HMOs around the country. The biggest that I know of is a $120.5 million verdict in California against Aetna. Now, 
Aetna loses money when it has to pay a verdict that big, but the long-term consequences are that the costs have to be passed on to the pay premium paying public through the employers. So employers are hurt and have a disincentive to offer benefits and their employees have to pay higher premiums. Are these jury trials? They are jury trials. Well, I can see how you could find a jury that didn't like an HMO and could maybe take it out on the company. Is that a problem? They take it out on the HMO. They yeah, can't take it I mean. out on the employer. That's right. Hmm. Well, <clears throat> we have something in Oklahoma called the Oklahoma External Review Act. Uh, Kevin, what is that? This is an act that was passed by the state legislature in 1999. It went into effect in February of 99, and it was aimed at addressing the biggest problem that people seem to have with their HMOs. All of the big verdicts that I alluded to arise in situations where a doctor wanted to provide certain care and the HMO or the insurance company thought that it was not medically necessary. So the state legislature here, like 40 other states, passed an act that said that a member has a right to go to an independent panel. The patient. The patient. The patient has a right to go to an independent panel of doctors to uh, act as an appeal, basically, of the health plan's denial of care on the grounds that it wasn't medically necessary. Well, Senator Henry, you being a member of the legislature, uh, what's been our experience so far with the External Review Act? Well, the External Review Act is still relatively new. Mm -hmm. It's been in existence approximately two years. We have there, there have been uh, 31 uh, procedures or, or, or uh, cases in the process mm -hmm. through the external review. Uh, 24 decisions have been rendered to date. Um, in those of those decisions that have been rendered, about 40 percent of the decisions have been in favor of the patient and 60 percent in favor of the HMO. So in 40 percent of the cases, the HMOs are overruled and told that they were not uh, treating the patient correctly. Well, uh, you also <clears throat> authored, I think, the Oklahoma Managed Health Care Reform and Accountability Act, a long, uh, a long name uh, <laughs> for an act that I, I know you think is important. Tell, tell the viewers about what this act does. Well, in a nutshell, uh, the Managed Care Reform and, and Accountability Act allows uh, patients or members of an HMO to sue their HMO when they are denied necessary covered care unreasonably. In other words, the treating physician says you need this procedure or you need this medication and the HMO unreasonably denies that, that uh, payment for that coverage it allows the patient to go through the internal review process of the particular HMO and then go through the external review process that we just discussed and then at the end of that uh, those processes uh, to actually sue the HMO in court. It, it requires that HMOs uh, live up to an, a standard of ordinary care just like we, we impose on every other person or, or entity. Kevin, what is your thought about imposing that we standard? Got, oh, just a few seconds left. If you could yeah. answer that in 30 seconds or so, Kevin, that'd be great. I, I, what was the question? I'm sorry. Uh, what do you think about that, uh, big, that uh, uh, ability to sue your HMO? Well, I think that fundamentally it means that we're treating patients as plaintiffs and prospective plaintiffs and not attending to their needs for prompt health care. We're putting them in a process where it may take years to redress a problem and they may win the lottery and get a multi-million dollar verdict at the end of the day. But it's not the way that patients ought to be treated. I like the External Review Act a lot better because it provides much quicker care when care is necessary. We're going to have to wrap it up there. Okay. Senator Henry, Mr. Gordon, thank you both for coming by. Kent and I'll be back with a few final thoughts when we return. You're watching The Verdict. My name is Ted Smith. I'm president of the board of directors of the Oklahoma Disability Law Center. ODLC provides free legal services in civil matters to people with physical and mental disabilities. I'm Mike Sykes, vice president of ODLC. For more information, call 1-800-880-7755. The Oklahoma Disability Law Center provides high quality legal services to people with physical and mental disabilities. What is MAPS for Kids? 
It's a sales tax and bond proposal to rebuild Oklahoma City area schools. The cost to you, pennies a day. And just like MAPS, it's temporary. The benefits, new or renovated schools for every child, the latest technology, strict fiscal accountability so we know where the money's being spent, and a safe classroom environment so our kids can prepare for the 21st century. MAPS for Kids, investing in our future by investing in our kids. the best in each student. That is the simple goal and tradition of Heritage Hall. The focus on the individual shapes the educational experience at Heritage Hall. Each student benefits from small classes, able, dedicated teachers, a solid academic curriculum, and exceptional co-curricular programs of athletics, arts, community service, and other activities, parental involvement, personalized counseling, and the development of responsibility, integrity, and love of learning. If you want education taught with pride, then you want Heritage Hall. Wrapping up another edition of The Verdict. Today we had a conversation concerning HMOs. Yes, uh, HMOs, a hot topic, uh, as we always try to have on The Verdict. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, as you know, we're going to have another show for our viewers on the status of HMOs in Oklahoma coming up soon in a week or so. Uh, HMOs are undergoing tremendous transition. They are coming in trying to compete for the health care dollar. They're competing against each other with sometimes uh, rather disastrous results for everyone involved, for the patient, for the medical provider, and for the HMO themselves. But I guess on the fundamental issue of today's show, should you be able to sue your HMO or not, that, folks, is your verdict. And we'd like to hear from you on whether you think you ought to have unlimited right to sue your HMO or it ought to be limited. And one way they could let us know is by going to our website, yes. theverdict.tv, not .com, but .tv, theverdict.tv. Go there on the World Wide Web and let us know what you think about the ability to sue your HMO. And we'll have another show on that subject, as Kent said. I want to thank our guests again, Brad Henry and Kevin Gordon. For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We'll see you next time on The Verdict. This program was brought to you by Crow and Dunleavy, a professional corporation. And also brought to you by a friend of Oklahoma Lawyers for Children and Delta Dental Plan of Oklahoma.